continue. So an hour ago, so we uh, stopped at this definition of strata of one forms. So the definition is still on the board. Um, so next, so I'd like to describe uh, some geometric structure on this space. So so far we defined it as a set. So you will see it's not only a set. It has, has a very natural uh, manifold structure. So let me define or describe a local coordinates for each mu called period coordinates. So you, you want to define local coordinates. What you do, you pick a point in this space H mu, a point corresponding to this data, a human surface along with a one form of this type. So let's take this point. So let's take and suppose we are given this specific point in H mu. Um, so x is a Riemann surface of genus G. And we know omega is a one form with like a, a zeros. So let's first take a basis of the first homology of x relative to uh, the endpoint P. So what we do is we take a basis of H1, x. And if you don't label these endpoints, it just gives you the absolute uh, homology. But now we have relative homology relative to the n mark points. So let's consider P1 up to Pn as markings on x with z coefficients. So first, so it is of rank so if without this marking, x is of genus G, so the H1 of absolute homology should be 2G dimensional. Now you have additional N markings, but this is H1, not pi1. So you add additional N minus 1 basis corresponding to loops, oh sorry, paths connecting PI. So the way we choose it, we can choose, so let's first give it name, basis say, gamma 1, gamma 2, up to gamma, so the total rank I just told you is 2 times genus plus n minus 1, because we don't need a base point. Um, so in the way that, so gamma i, so gamma 1 up to gamma 2g is a, is a basis for the absolute uh, homology h1 without marking. And this additional gamma, so gamma 2g plus i minus 1 for i varying from 1 to uh, 1, um, maybe for i varying from 1 to n minus 1 is a, uh, let me do it this way, so is, a, is, a, is a path connecting p1, say, to pi. So this is gamma 2g minus i minus 2g plus i minus 1. So globally, the picture looks like you have some absolute uh, periods given by the first 2g gamma. And suppose you take p1, and you have some other p2 and p3 up to pn you have some additional basis given by this extra gamma i. Okay. So what we do is that now you have this one dimensional path, gamma, and you have one form. You can integrate one form along the path. So, okay. so we consider the integration of omega along gamma 1 up to z 
the last gamma, gamma 2g plus and minus 1. So in this case, you just get 2g plus n minus 1 complex numbers. So these 2g plus n minus 1 complex numbers are called pure coordinates for this base h mu. This integrals, there's sort of like numbers. So let me explain why at least it makes sense to think of these numbers actually. This integration of omega along gamma gives you current local coordinates of h mu. So I already m remarked this only gives you a local description. So the way to think about it, again, so what maybe the best way to think about it is using this flat polygon presentation. So we have this identification or correspondence between a one form and a uh, translation surface, right? Let me just maybe illustrate this in this example. For instance, in the example of genes one case, so here is genes one and the one form has no zero, so you don't have um, relative pair, you only have absolute pair given by gamma 1, gamma 2. So you see clearly in this picture, for instance, I can choose the yellow line to be gamma 1, the red line to be gamma 2. Right. And the way to parameterize this data altogether, suppose you want to perturb it, well, you can just arbitrarily locally deforming the shape and the size of this parallelogram. But when you say deforming locally, that really means you change the complex length of these two vectors, gamma 1, gamma 2. For instance, I can, if I deform it, then I can do some like, uh, well, if you want to make it slightly longer and narrower, you can do some like... Uh, right? That tells you locally this deforming just occurred really corresponding to changing these complex vectors gamma i. And these gamma i's are just coming from periods. And you think about, in this picture, this gamma i, how to evaluate this complex length. That's exactly the integra integration of omega along this path. So from this flat geometric viewpoint, it's sort of at least a heuristic argument. These 2g plus n minus 1 numbers, they give you l only local coordinates for, at least some local coordinates for the space h and this perturbation corresponding to changing the shape and size just by changing these edges in this Euclidean plane. But when you change it, you see the gluing pattern are preserved. And you do not go outside of the space. You just get another slightly different one form. And also the underlying complex stru structure might also change because in this picture, the two tori actually they might have different complex stru uh, structures or different J invariants. Right. Yeah, maybe let me quickly summarize. So the key point is here. This is explained in this example. This the key point is this integration of omega along gamma i, really corresponding to the edges in the flat polygon description of omega.
yeah, so deforming this flat poly polygon just correspond to changing the values of this 2G plus and minus 1 complex numbers. So this sort of also partially answered one question like Yuna asked. So maybe this is not quite canonical, but at least one way to cut out your surface and decompose into this way, just along this 2G plus n minus 1 basis and integrate omega. These values give you these edges of uh, some polygon in the Euclidean plane, and you have to identify them. Because the cut, it, I guess, like you cut it, it becomes two, like, like two, two sides along this cutting. So I have to identify them as like one pair of parallel vectors in the Euclidean plane. This quickly tells us a nice corollary. So we know how many other there are exactly two G plus and minus minus one that tells us this space H mu can be regarded as a two G plus and minus one complex dimensional uh, manifold. So this indicates let me erase this example to see. So this, as a consequence, this tells us which mu is a smooth, is a complex manifold of complex dimension equal to this number, 2g. And just one very minor remark, I don't want to go into details, this doesn't really bother anything under the current discussion, but like somebody mentioned Orbifold in the first hour, so I just want to say here, if you consider this complex manifold, maybe a more precise word, really in the sense of Orbifold, is a complex like uh, Orbifold indeed. It's a better or more precise word. The reason why it's not quite manifold is because some Riemann surfaces along with this one form might have additional automorphism compared to other one forms. Just like when you deal with modular space of Riemann surfaces, you know, it's not quite, it's close to be a smooth, <laughs> smooth thing, but it's not quite everywhere smooth. There might be some finite quotient singularity, right? Why is there like finite quotient singularity? Just because that special Riemann surface has additional automorphism. You have to quotient it out. So here, the same thing. Maybe some, this flat polygon has additional automorphism. So when you consider the global structure at that point, it was become sort of an orbifold point. But that does really not, uh, doesn't really, I mean, it's not a serious issue. <coughs> Okay, so let's just check one example to make sure this dimension count is correct. So for example, let's, so bear in mind this n comes from what? This n comes from the number of entries in the partition or the number of distinct zeros for omega, right? So let's take the most general case. Let's take mu, this partition to be one, 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 all entries are equal to 1, because they sum up to 2g minus 2. So the number of entries in this case is just 2g minus 2 ones, right? And in this case, according to this dimension formula, so this dimension of the corresponding strata has to be predicted by this formula 2g plus n, in this case, is 2g minus 2 minus 1. That is equal to 4g minus 3, okay. And 4g minus 3, I'd like to write it as follows, 3g minus 3 plus g. If you still remember, let me just put it here. So still remember the total Hodge bundle over the modular space of genus G surface, Riemann surfaces. So we mentioned, so this is a rank G bundle. So fiber has dimension 
g-dimensional. And here we take the general partition one on one that consider like that uh, correspond to one forms which you take generally with only simple zeros. Right? So that should give you an open subset inside the Hodge bundle, which has equal dimension to the dimension of the Hodge bundle. So now you know the Hodge bundle has rank G, so this is G, and the base HG, MG. And you know, hopefully you know, the dimension of the modular space of G Riemann surfaces is also 3G minus 3. So they add up to be the right dimension, at least for this open dense subset inside the hard bound. And when this partition becomes more special, that means you take special one forms, zeros collide, to form a zeros of higher order, and the number of distinct zeros decreases, right? So uh, correspondingly, the dimension of this parameter space becomes smaller and smaller. Just means you go into more specialized, deeper strata inside the total hot bound. So at least it works in this case. So it makes sense. And before we move on, another remark. So so far, so I hope I have convinced you this HMU has a nice geometric structure. It can be regarded as a complex manifold or orbifold, whatever. However, I did not claim it is irreducible or connected. So there's one like mysterious thing, or maybe one surprising result is that sometimes this space HMU can be disconnected. So it breaks into several components, disconnected, but all of them are smooth of equal dimension. This part, the dimension count, is local. But I'm not saying globally it is always connected. So let me put a remark there. That remark has more relation to geometry of algebraic curves. for special signature mu. And for instance, if you take this general uh, partition 111, you get open dense subset of the Hodge bundle. Hodge bundle is irreducible, so this guy as an open dense subset must be irreducible or connected. But in general, if you take special signature mu, this space could be disconnected. Let me show you one example that also explains the situation in general. So example is the following. Let's take mu, let's take genus equal to 3. And 2g minus 2 in this case is 4. Let's take mu equal to just a partition of 2g minus 2 consisting of a single entry of a value equal to 4. And what is this space? In this case, I claim this space consists of two components. They are disjoint. So let me label them as follows. This is disjoint union. So there are two components. The first one is called a hyperelliptic component, this HYP corresponding to the uh, hyperelliptic for short. So let's start from here. So as I said, so this is, you have x, omega. So x is always genus 3, and omega has a single 0 of 1 out of 4. However, in this case, for the hyperelliptic component, we require x to be a hyperelliptic genus 3 curve. Like this, genus 3 and hyperelliptic. And moreover, in this case, you're, if you are familiar with the uh, geometry of hyperelliptic curves, hyperelliptic just means you have a double cover to P1, right? And then there are like 2G plus 2 special branch points associated to the double cover to P1. And in this case, if omega has a order 4 vanishing point, that point has to be one of these 2G plus 2 branch point, sorry, ramification point under this double cover. So these forces like omega 0 equal to 4P 
where P in X is a so-called wireless point, that is one of these 2G plus 2 ramification point under the hybrid double cover of P1. So that is So this double cover is a definition of being a hybrid curve. And there are 2G plus 2 ramification points in X. So every one of them can be a unique zero of order 4 for the special one form omega. So that's one possibility. And for the other one, <coughs> So labeled by a different name called odd. What is it? So again, so it parameterizes genus 3 Riemann surface x along with the one form omega v r. So x is genus 3, but we require x to be non hybridic in the first place. That's already distinguished them. So x is genus 3, but non hybridic And x is a smooth genus 3 algebraic curve. Non hyperbolic, then it admits a canonical embedding into Pg minus 1, that is um, Cp2. So let me use this part. <coughs> so because of this non hyperbolic condition, so that tells us x and makes a canonical embedding into CP2 by the canonical associated canonical line bundle and its sections. And the degree of this plane curve, the image of x isomorphic to x, is of degree 4 in this case. right? So this image is a, is a so-called plane cartic curve. That is degree 4, plane curve. And in this case, so let's draw this picture. I have a complex plane. Sorry, it's a two dimensional complex two dimensional plane. I have uh, some smooth algebraic curve going inside the image of X under the conical embedding. Then this condition just means so a one form is just a section of the conical bundle that is a the underlying zero is a section a line section of the conical curve. We have some special point P here where x admits a line section, let's call it L, where L cut out x only at one point p. And this p is a tangent point and is a very high tangent order of tangent order equal to 4. So such point means so this Cartier curve x admits a so-called a hyperflex point. That is. So under this conical embedding picture, there exists a line L in this P2 such that scheme theoretically L cut x is equal to P with multiplicity 4. Okay. And this L, you can consider it as a section of the conical line bound of x that gives you the one form omega up to scaling. So such x also exists because you can really write down a degree 4 polynomial with three variables homogeneous. And you fix a line L, fix a point P, and you ask uh, this polynomial to have contact order 4 to L as this point P. And then you can impose some linear condition to the coefficient. You can really cut out this polynomial and you write down it explicitly. And it does exist. And it's also because. If x was hyperelliptic, it wouldn't have a conical embedding. It will be mapping to the conic two to one cover. So these two conditions really di distinguish the two situations. You get a disjoint union. And it's not hard to verify. So every point in H4 in this case has to belong to 
either one of the two cases. And that sort of also is a more or less rigorous proof to show that this guy breaks into two components disjoint. And you can also do dimension count. This dimension has the right dimension given by 2g minus 2 plus a single 0 plus 1. That is, this is three dimensional. This is also such x omega is three dimensional. Uh, 2g minus 1, five dimensional. I haven't really explained this name. Why do we call it odd? So there's a more intrinsic reason. So let me take out this point P, satisfying the condition. So omega has a quadrupole 0 P. So this really comes from the following intrinsic reason. So I take, so we know 4 P in this case is a canonical divisor. It's linearly equivalent to the canonical land bound of x. So we can take one half of this canonical bundle, so 2p. So this, as a holomorphic land bound of x, is sort of a square root of the canonical land bundle. So it's a so-called a theta characteristic or spin structure, if you like. Because it comes from one half of the canonical land bundle. Then there's a parity mod 2, depending on the number of global sections of this bundle, mod 2. So h naught ox 2p. So in this picture, for this plan cortic, actually it's always equal to 1 or congruent to 1 mod 2, in this case. So this congruent to 1 corresponding to this notation being odd. And here, hyperliptic, in this case, I mean, it's not only hyperliptic, there is some other. If you want to look at this half of the conical divisor, in this case, it's not OX 2P. Just because P is chosen to be one of the ramification points, so this, this bundle and this section actually induces this double cover. So this has turns out to be 2, or congruent to 0 mod 2. So that's another way to see they are disjoint because so the parity, so this congruent to one or zero, so in general. So the so H naught of uh, theta characteristic. So congruent to zero or one mod two is a is a deformation invariant in a family. In other words, suppose you give me a flat family of smooth in C curves carrying with a family of theta characteristic on it, then for each theta characteristic in this family, H naught of uh, mod 2 has to be all equal to 0 or all equal to 1. It's definitely invariant. There is also some topological interpretation. This is quite classical, say, dating back to like uh, maybe even late. I think in the 70s, like Atiyah, Mumford, and uh, maybe on the topology side, Johnson. Yeah, it's called spin structure. This may be uh, more coming from the topological side. Anyway, so this pretty much is a general behavior for the uh, phenomenon of being disconnected. So I won't explain or tell you the ex exact result about the number of, about the classification of components of H mu, but let me just point it out. There is a general result. It's a theorem proved by Conceiving Zorich maybe 15 years ago, completely describing all connected components for every H mu. So this is all known. There's a theorem due to Conceivich and Zorich. I think about the year of 2003, something like that, but it must be known earlier. So roughly speaking, so they completely classified. So it's a complete classification of connected components of all H mu. For all genus. Okay. So there is no uh, missing case. It's complete. And uh, in, in sum, 
so the worst case, maybe you can ask what is the most special HMU that has like maybe the maximum number of disconnected components, it at most three. In particular, so HMU has up to three, or at most three disconnected components. It really depends on the signature mu, as you saw from some earlier example. And what happens if there are three disconnected components? That's the worst case, right? If it shows up to be three, this three really comes from if three really occurs. So th the phenomenon is caused by exactly the same thing. You have some kind of hyperplectic behavior, and also uh, odd spin and uh, even spin behavior. So this three really comes from hyperliptic and uh, odd or even spin structure. And if you don't see this behavior, then the strata is connected. And if you only see two behaviors, then it has two connected components. So in this, two example, in yes. this example, uh, if you're projecting, then they do not meet that in the MG. So all components <coughs> Good question. So in this case, if I project to MG because X is non hyperliptic and hyperliptic, yeah. so they remain disjoint. Yeah. In general, this is false. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because look, so especially from the odd and even spin, I think if the hyperliptic might be a special case, but from odd and even spin, if they both exist. But the in higher genus, you, for instance, you might have a special human surface, the same human surface. You know, as human can admits both. Yeah, it's it's false. Yeah, the hyperliptic might be okay. Yeah, the hyperliptic somehow is the most special, well understood situation, because it's nothing but like you know human sphere with two G plus two special points that uniquely determine hybrid curve and conversely. But for the other two. Even if you map to MG, they might become, like they might intersect. Is it also true always projection images uh, also manifold? I mean, it's at least some kind of subvariety, right? Because upstairs you get uh, quasi projective subvariety you project. Okay. Yeah, so, I mean, it might become singular. Yeah, you lose this pure. Pure is, is sensitive to the one form. If you lose it, only com compute the, the complex structure. Um, I don't think it's as nice as in the hot bundle. But you do get uh, some kind of, after taking closure, it gets some kind of subvariety. Yeah, there are some ongoing research to describe the relation between each strata and its projection to MG. Yeah. OK. Other questions? OK. So I think I have explained this uh, situation for strata. And there's another thing I mentioned earlier. So this there is a so-called GL2 action. So let me get to that point. First, let me say that so this is a group of two by two matrices with real entries. And this plus just means I consider the determinant to be positive. If the determinant is negative, then this group becomes like, disconnect, uh, like disconnected, right? Because the determinant is non zero. So let's just take the one connect, uh, component consisting of positive determinant, just like two by two real matrices, OK, with positive determinant. That we know. So how does this action look like? So this action really is a special way to deforming one forms or deforming the corresponding flat polygons. So what we do is the following. 
So let me first present a geometric way to define it. Then there's a local coordinate way to define it. So you can think of as follows. So take a point in H mu that is a one form on the Riemann surface x, right? Okay. Now you 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 you, you take the suppose you have a polygon presentation, say. Let me do it like this. Suppose this is a it's polygon or translation surface presentation. Okay, and with some gluing, see these edges, these edges, and these edges glued together. Now, suppose you give me a two by two matrix as an element there. So for A as a two by two matrix belonging to this group. So the image of A acting on this, this point we define. Be, well, look, so we have this identification between uh, transition surfaces and run forms. So I can just tell you on the, s on the side of transition surfaces, what is the resulting transition surface that will also determine the run form up to isomorphism. So I have, suppose this is the original transition surface corresponding to this one form. So now I have a two by two matrix. I can just use it as a two by two matrix acting on this Euclidean plane. And just by changing the shape or size of this polygon by this matrix, right? So that is simple. I suppose you take some matrix, depending on the values of the entries, maybe it looks like something like this. Right? Something like that. So this is just by like acting on the. A, the Euclidean plane. So this is a Euclidean plane. Right. But uh, apparently, this action preserves the gluing pattern, the number of edges, how they identify together, the vertices. The topological information is unchanged. Now, this corresponding to another, maybe possibly different complex structure or complex Riemann surface, maybe x prime then also possibly different one forms, let's call, call it omega prime. The thing is this guy has the same topological information, so it still lies in the same strata h mu. Okay. So I can see where about how acting a to x, but uh, how acting a to 0 for w? I mean, look, so this picture, mm -hmm. really sensitive to omega, for instance, this is just like the vertices, right? On this, uh, so on this on point, or? I mean, you can well, you can you can I guess you can you can remove the total polygon. For instance, you shift it by to some other positions. Mm -hmm. So then these two are diff like isomorphic, right? Mm -hmm. So up to so you can you can choose some point to be your origin and act. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. So you can globally shift the polygon to another one. As long as this is a global translation, so certainly the corresponding two polygons are isomorphic. So that will define the, for instance, you do this square here and square there, they define the same flat tori. So the exact position in the Euclidean plane does not matter. Only the relative position of the edges and the shape and the size matters. So in fact, A acting, G acting on the four Hatch bundles? Yes, yes. But not fiber-wise? Not fiber-wise, yeah. So the action of SO2, can preserve the...? SL2 preserves the area, if you, if you prefer. But GL2 can enlarge the area, larger or smaller. Yeah. So you can also pick an element in SL2. Is that your question? SO2 oh. may... Does SO2 preserve area. point-wise elements in H? 
pointwise element. So an element here actually is a, is, a, is a concrete polygon up to this cutting and pasting. So no matter you take, you're taking, so modern, most generally you take GL2, that means you change not only the shape of the polygon, also the size, right? But if you choose a only element from SL2, SL2 preserving the area of this guy. Yeah, for instance. SO2. SO2 corresponding to rotation. Yes, so yeah. it preserves each point. Each point each X. in what? X omega. So stabilize of X it stabilize omega. each point. Um, rotation basically means you change omega by multiplying a complex number with norm 1. Right? That exactly means the underlying zeros as their position in X and are preserved. Right? For instance, if you yeah, so you raise a good question. So, yeah, there are similar if you do, let me maybe write it down since you already mentioned. If you do SL2R, this is a special action preserving areas of these translation surfaces. And uh, you, if you do S2R, SO2, that uh, this is corresponding to rotation. Or in terms of one form, that really means that is omega. So this actually preserves the underlying complex structure. You're right, but it changes omega by multiplying a complex number of norm one. Right. <coughs> yeah. In other words, if you want to look at essentially the underlying canonical divisors associated with omega, you have to model this kind of stabilizer. Yeah, that's a good point. Well, I mean, this is one way to think of this, uh, this action. So if you prefer local kernels, one can also do it, which is less geometric, but at least that's one way to think of it. So alternatively, so let's describe this action as follows by local coordinates. So let's see at least away from the zeros of omega. So let's write write omega locally, write omega as say is you choose some right coordinates right, right, right omega is dx plus i this imaginary number root of minus one times dy by choosing suitable coordinate away from zero omega right omega in this way okay then so suppose you have a acting on this one form will give you something like let me write down a times omega first. Well, also you just do this to write your matrix x on. Now you do dx, dy. You will get. Um, now let's see. Let me do it as follows. Maybe let us do a omega as. Uh, let me not write omega, but that rest x, y, sorry. Let's see which way it goes. Okay, let's do this. Now you just think of x and y really gives you the basis for the standard Euclidean plane. That's how you think of compared to the first description. Suppose acting on x and y by this matrix A, you get a new basis as denoted by x prime and y prime. Okay? Denoted by x prime y prime. So now let's say, then we define the resulting image of omega under this action A to be something of omega prime to be 
dx prime plus i times dy prime. Well, the issue is because this matrix A has real entry, right? This A comes from GL2R. It's not uh, something holomorphic. So there's no guarantee if you do this, the resulting thing is still holomorphic on the original Riemann surface X, right? Because this action A has real entry. But if you apply some knowledge, for instance, in conformal geometry, if you treat X now as a topological surface, then if you give a form like this, there exists uniquely up to isomorphism a, com a complex structure which might be different from the original one. Under this new complex structure, the resulting one form becomes holomorphic again. So there exists a possibly new X prime. Like a like different Riemann surface, new Riemann surface of the same genus G, so that on this new Riemann surface X prime, the resulting new one form omega prime becomes holomorphic again. On X prime. So in this way, we just define the total pair. Then we just define. A acting on x omega to be the pair, this possibly new different Riemann surfaces x prime, along with the resulting one form omega prime. In other words, holomorphic one forms always carry more information than complex structure. Now, this is maybe like a local description. So sometimes I prefer the first description using the flat geometry way to see the variation under GL2. Well, let's just put some remark as uh, we already discussed some of them. The first, so this action in any case, no matter which de description you take, preserves uh, the signature of the one form. The number of edges and the green pattern and the number of vertices are unchanged. The total angles are also preserved under this. So it tells us really so this GL2R. X on um, the total Hodge bundle and also preserving each stratum, each mu. Right. Or really, X on each, each mu. The action descends to each strata, each mu. So you do get a gl 2 action on each strata, each mu. But they also work uh, together, compatible, if you consider their union in the hard bundle. So let's just do one example. So again, let's do the genus 1 case. This is the simplest way. Well, that we know how to describe a one form on a torus. We saw it several times. You just draw a parallelogram, right? OK. Now, suppose you, as I mentioned, you can take a, like a base point to be your origin. So suppose you just take this point to be your origin. Now you apply in a, you take a 2 by 2 matrix called A under this action. So depending on A, but you might get something like, uh, like this. Right, you just get a parallelogram of different shape. And in this way, for the genus 1 case, it's quite special. You get parallelogram of average shape you want. It does cover all possible non-zero one forms along with all possible toroi. Okay, so genus 1 is simple, but it illustrates the idea. In higher general, it's quite complicated. We know some result, and there are some recent breakthrough I'm going to mention. But let's first say what is a leading or the major question in this field. So this action has a special name. This action 
It's called the, uh, that's the title in my talk called Tech Mirror Dyna Dynamics. It refers to this GL2 or sometimes SL2 action on the Hodge bundle and each strata, each mu. Right, so that's the name. I mean, there are like some hidden relation to tech mirror theory and the tech mirror space. Maybe you can already sense some of them, but I won't mention it. So there are some facts we have already know. So first. Let me give you some general result we know. To this action, um, so in order to understand this action, you have to understand, suppose you give me a point, x omega in the strata h mu, and you look at the corresponding orbit under this action. You ask, how does this orbit look like? Now you have a geometric space h mu. This orbit may go around or vertically. It may take a, only occupies a small, maybe proper subset. Or maybe it's like uh, even forms after tick enclosure some nice sub variety. Who knows? So these are questions we'd like to know. So first, let me be weak for general point. In other words, for each strata h mu, suppose you take a general one form in h mu. So its orbit. Let me just, for short, just write down its GL orbit. Or occasionally, I'll just drop GL, just say its orbit under this action. <laughs> really goes ergodically in the space H mu. What does this mean? So I'm not uh, like a <laughs> like a person doing dynamics. So let me just say it in a very naive language. Suppose you have a space, goes logically, just like, comes back and forth, and you take the closure, closure you get the total space. This is not precise. For instance, for being logarithmic, you have to describe some measure, and uh, so on and so forth. But it's irrelevant to, 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 to this lecture series. So this only happens to special point, OK? So this is a result, I believe, very classical, dating back to Howard Mazur and maybe Veach and possibly some other people, but yeah, in the even 80s maybe. Or maybe John Smiley. Yeah. So this is a general behavior. So the really interesting point now comes into understanding special G orbits. So the leading question in this field is the following. Let me mark it. This is really the major question in understanding tech mirror dynamics. It is to classify so all special orbits <coughs> special orbits in the sense that it does not go agartically especially if you take the closure, it gives you a proper subset in the space. So special in the sense that whose closure is a proper subset in H mu. It's not the whole space. Okay. It's properly contained. So that cannot be ergodic. And sometimes even better, we not only want to understand this proper subset, maybe we would like to understand this geometric structure. For the strata, look, this H mu itself is invariant under the action, right? Each orbit goes inside H, H mu. And H mu has pure coordinates, which describes it as a complex manifold of certain dimension. So really, at least dating back to several decades ago, when people started studying tech mirror dynamics, they had a hope to see that even, even now, we have no idea how to completely classify all special orbits. It's completely open. But people hoped to at least, in principle, describe or get some structural theorem saying any such orbit closure is not only a subset, but it's some 
like special submanifold inside the HMU with a nice structure similar to the period coordinates. That result, surprisingly, was established about two years ago. Let me maybe write it down as sort of an ending remark for today's lecture. Because I promised in the abstract of my talk, let me mention this point. So that also is one of the most important breakthrough, I believe, in the last maybe 30 years of this study. This really usually considered this is like a, I mean some expert in this theorem in this field call it a, like a fantastic theorem. <laughs> it's not my theorem, but it's done by asking and uh, Mother Honey. So if you were at the so ICM last summer, Mother Harney won her field medal, and um, this is part of her major work for the field medal. So what it tells us is the following. For any, really for any, GL to R orbit in H mu. Although we don't know how to classify it, just in principle, they can conclude the following structure theorem. So for any orbit, its closure is a so-called linear manifold. It's not only a smooth submanifold, but has an even better structure, linear in the sense I'm going to tell you. A linear submanifold, maybe inside HMU. I.e., so let me express this linear submanifold. So this closure, it is locally cut out by linear equations. Um, so H mu has pure coordinates, right? So locally, you can think of H mu is a vector space of dimension 2g plus n minus 1, where n is the number of zeros. So you use this period as local coordinates. You can write down, in principle, linear equations on pure coordinates. <coughs> of H mu. It's not only linear, these equations have only real coefficients, with real coefficients only. That's why they call it linear submanifold. There were also some like uh, subsequent following up work so these real coefficients for number theorists in the audience, they are not actually only real numbers. They are algebraic in nature. They are some kind of algebraic number. But this field extension to Q, I mean, this could be like a high degree. Who knows? Yeah, I think there are like even some other follow-up work by Simeon Philip. So these real coefficients are actually in there like some, if I remember correctly, yeah, this part I didn't really check, so there are like these real equations could be like algebraic numbers, algebraic. In particular, this tells you this gr to r orbit closure, they are in principle defined over, over, over number field. And there are some other hot theory, variation of hot structure coming into play, but that part is like uh, too much beyond the, this lecture series. Okay, so I think the plan is the next time I'm going to tell you, in this sense, the most special orbit closure. That is something like the minimum dimensional orbit closure, which is called Tachmere curve. Then we are going to define some invariant associated to this Tachmere curve and uh, try to use 
um, idea from intersection theory on the module space curve to solve these values for these dynamical invariants. Yeah, let's stop it for today.